If you're doing any hand sawing in your shop, you need a shooting board. No matter how steady your hand, no matter how expensive your saw, your cut won't be perfectly square all the time. Heck, it won't be perfectly square most of the time. A shooting board fixes all these problems. It's just a flat platform with a track to hold a hand plane and a fence set at 90 degrees. The fence holds your work while you move your plane back and forth and slowly feed the wood into the plane. With this setup, the plane can take fine shavings and slice cleanly through those tough end grain fibers. Your right angle is built into the jig, so you don't need to worry about it, and the fence supports the back edge of the wood, so you won't blow it out while you're shooting. With a well-built shooting board, you can get perfect 90 degree ends, even if you're still learning to use your tools. But here's the problem. You build a shooting board so that you can get perfect 90 degree ends on your boards. But in order for it to work, the board itself has to have a perfect 90 degree angle built in. And maybe you're a new hand tool woodworker. Maybe you're struggling to get precision in your work. So how are you supposed to build the damn thing? Don't worry. I've come up with a straightforward design that you can make completely by hand and still get perfect accuracy in the final product. This shooting board is flat and square, and the fence is adjustable, so you can dial in a square cut even if it's not absolutely perfect when you build it. When you're done, you'll have a reliable shop fixture that's going to be durable and give you oh, years Rex. of trouble for... Rex, for no man, no, 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 <laughs> you're doing it all wrong, man. Okay, first off, you're making a simple shooting board here. Now, that's like one step up from a bench hook, but we really want to have a shooting board that can do some fun things. Like, see, now this, this is a shooting board. Not only can it do 90 degrees, this can also do miters. And we can put it to any angle, so if we want to do a hexagon, a septagon, or something with multi-sides, or I could even grab this, and now we put that in there, we can do donkey ears. Bells and whistles, man, bells and whistles. This is what a shooting board is all about. And besides, anyone can make a regular shooting board, but it takes wooden shoes to make one this cool. Oh, did I mention that this build is a collaboration with James from Wood by Right? I've been looking forward to it. Over the years, I've built a bunch of different shooting boards, and every design I've used has had some shortcomings. Some of them don't stay square, others aren't sturdy enough, and there are others that I like, but they're hard to build. The problem you have with any shooting board is that your fence right here needs to be at a perfect 90 degrees to the track. It's got to be perfectly square and it's got to stay perfectly square. So a good solution that a lot of people use is they just install this fence permanently. This one is glued and screwed in place and it's not going to move no matter what happens. The problem is it's always getting knocked around by the shooting plane and the fence is made of solid wood so it could move. What happens over time is this fence is going to drift out of true, and it's not impossible to trim it back straight, but it's not easy. Now, another design that a lot of people like is a wedged design. So here's another kind of shooting board, and here the fence is sitting in a tapered slot in the board. This has obvious advantages. It's held really tightly, and if anything happens to your fence, you can just pull it out, make a new one, and put a new one in there. It's a great design. The only problem is you still need absolute perfection on this 90 degree slot, or it doesn't matter what you do with your fence, the board is still going to be inaccurate. Another popular solution is to use an adjustable fence that's just held down with some sort of threaded hardware. This is a great idea because then your fence can be micro adjusted and you can dial in something perfect. But while you're using it, while you're running that plane back and forth, well, you might knock that fence just a tiny bit out of alignment and then you might not even notice until you're deep into a project, and that can be very inconvenient. So here's what we're gonna do instead. With the design we're using in this video, we're gonna combine a fixed fence with a movable fence. The fixed fence is glued and screwed to the shooting board, so it's not gonna move no matter what. And it doesn't have to be perfectly square, because we're also adding an adjustable fence that's held on with hardware and slotted so it can move back and forth and be shot in and trued up over time as it gets chewed up. If the original fence isn't 100% perfect, well then the movable fence can be shimmed or trimmed or adjusted to make everything perfect. And if it ever needs to be replaced, you can just replace this one little bit and the rest of the shooting board is still going to work great. Traditionally, shooting boards were made from solid wood, but that stuff moves, and seasonal movement is going to throw our shooting board out of square. 
For this build, we're going to go with engineered materials. The base of my board is this piece of melamine. It's really flat and stable because it's just particle board with a plastic coating on each face. There's no need to pay for it. Melamine is what most IKEA furniture is made out of. Just wait until someone's throwing away a cheap bookcase and grab the shelves. I always keep a couple in the shop. You're also going to need a half inch thick piece of some other engineered wood. I'm going with birch plywood, but you can also use MDF or even more melamine if that's what you've got sitting around. I'm sure someone has an opinion on my choice of materials. Yeah, um, unfortunately I have to agree with you there. Plywood really is the way to go. Ha! Working composite materials with hand tools is no problem, and cheap tools are actually better for this kind of work. My inexpensive hard point saw goes right through this melamine without the saw teeth getting ruined, and I can plane the edges no problem. Plywood and particle board are hard on blades, so I do most of the work with my cheap scrub plane, and then just bring in a nicer plane at the very end. Plywood is the same way. It planes with no trouble. The edge I'm working here is the edge my plane will ride against, and it needs to be perfectly straight. A long jointer plane would be handy, but you can joint stock with a short plane just by checking it with a straight edge and then selectively working on the high spots. If you don't have a straight edge, that's okay too. Just use the factory edge of your shelf. It should be very straight. Here's the basic construction. The melamine gives a low friction track for the plane, and the plywood keeps the plane traveling straight and elevates the work so that it's in contact with the blade. Now, there's always a problem with sawdust getting caught in the corner and pushing your plane away from the track, but that's an easy fix. I'm just going to plane a narrow chamfer on the edge of my plywood, and when I put that chamfer down against the base, it forms a dust groove that will keep the plane running true. Laminating the parts together can take a lot of clamps, but an easy workaround is to use screws together with glue to make a strong bond without any clamping. I'm using my big wooden tri-square to lay out the locations. To drill the screws, I bore the countersink first, which keeps the bit on track and gives me a smooth hole. Then I can drill through both boards and pre-thread my screws. What kind of newfangled witchcraft is going on with that brace? Come on, man. We want to do some real boring work. No argument from me, James. You do the most boring work every week. Wood glue won't stick to low friction melamine. So we're going to use epoxy and a bit of blue tape to keep the adhesive off the plane track. You'll need to rough up the surface with a bit of sandpaper. Mix up a generous blob of five minute epoxy and lay it down evenly with an old credit card. Since everything is already pre-drilled, you can use two screws to align your pieces. And there's no messing around while you've got the clock ticking with quick set adhesive. An electric drill driver does make this work fast, but you can do it the old fashioned way and it won't take much longer. Of course, once my two pieces were together, I took a look and realized they were quite twisted. So before the glue had a chance to set up, I pulled out all the fasteners, yanked the two boards apart, and then redid it. I clamped the whole thing flat to my workbench and ran the screws in again. Now, this might not happen to you, but it is something to look out for during the build. Once it's assembled, there's no need to wait for the glue to dry. The fasteners will keep everything together, and I can add a cleat to the underside, where it will register against the edge of my bench and resist the pushing force of the plane. People often get confused about how a shooting board can work. They think, well, you've got a plane and it's riding back and forth on this track with the blade sticking out. So of course, the plane blade must always be chewing away at this plywood and eventually ruin the shooting board. Well, it doesn't actually work like that. If you look at any of your bench planes carefully, you'll see that the blade extends most of the way across the sole, but there's a little lip over here where the blade doesn't cover. This part right here can't cut into your jig. So the plane will cut, but only for the first few strokes. Then the sole comes into contact with the wood and it stops cutting. Here, I'm deliberately making these first cuts. This is called running in, and it's essential for accuracy in the next step. Now, to place my fence, I don't want to reference off the edge of the plywood. Instead, I'm going to use the sole of the plane since that's the thing that really needs to be perpendicular to the fence. I'm using a metal combination square here, but you can use a homemade wooden square if you just retract your plane blade and keep it out of the way. My fence is just any square hunk of hardwood, and you can see me applying the glue very thinly. When I place my fence against my square, I have a second to make adjustments, but that thin layer of glue tacks up very fast. If I added a clamp, 
or fasteners now, the fence would move. So I just walk away and let it dry overnight. The next day, I add long screws for a solid hold, and then I use my plane to trim off the little bit of the fence I left overhanging the track. At this point, I could stop and have a totally functional shooting board. But that fixed fence would give us trouble eventually. If we look at my old shooting board, we can see that it's still square, but the fence has gotten really chewed up over the years. It's not supporting the edge of the wood anymore, and I can tilt my plane without even noticing, which is very bad for accuracy. So my new board will have a second fence that's both adjustable and replaceable. My new shooting board is great for cross-cutting, and I've actually stopped using a bench hook for sawing. It's much better just to have one appliance that lets you saw the piece and then immediately true it up with the plane. I want an accurate fit between my two fences. You can see here that I've got a bit of a gap, but it's easy to plane my second fence a little bit and get rid of that wobble. When the front of my fence isn't exactly square, I can adjust that too. It's worth taking a little extra time to get things really perfect. To hold my adjustable fence, I'm using this cheap furniture hardware. You can pick this up at the big box store, and I will link to it down in the description, but you could also just use a couple of machine screws or nuts and bolts. Anything threaded will get the job done. I drill my fence, place my screws, and then give them a tap to mark my drilling location on the board. Then I drill all the way through my base, which lets me flip the board over and countersink for my hardware. A dab of super glue is enough to hold things in place. These nuts won't be under much pressure. My movable fence needs slots instead of holes so that it can travel from side to side. So I add two more holes and use my DIY turning saw to slice out the waste in between those holes. This tool makes it easy and you can build your own for a few dollars. I'll link to the video and the plans down in the description. Whatever hardware you use, you might find it's too long. Luckily, trimming screws to length is easier than you think. You just cut off the unneeded section with a hacksaw and then dress the end with a file to get rid of any burrs and restore the slight taper that helps the screw start in the nut. You can really tell by eye when you've got good threads that will start cleanly. Screw your fence down so that it overhangs just a bit and then shoot it even with the fixed fence. Now you can test your shooting board with any random plank of wood, as long as it has one straight edge to sit against the fence. I got lucky, and my shooting board produces a perfect 90 degree angle already. But if yours is a little bit off, it's no problem. This is why the second fence is adjustable. You can loosen your screws and shim the adjustable fence with a bit of paper or a plane shaving to get that perfect 90 degree angle. As your fence inevitably gets chewed up from shooting, you can just slide it out over the track and shoot it square again. And if your fence ever needs to be replaced, you can make a new one without making any changes to the rest of the board. For instance, I forgot to chamfer the bottom edge of my fence, and you need a place for dust to go, just like we did with the edge of the plywood. Adding that detail is easy, and I don't have to change anything else. Now as it is, our shooting board is already great for short pieces of wood like this. They balance on the board, no problem, and all I have to do is push them forward while I'm shooting. The problem comes when I start to use longer pieces of wood, like this one. The board isn't wide enough to support the whole piece of stock, and while I'm holding it, I've got to be pushing it against the fence and pushing down on it pretty hard while I try to concentrate on shooting and getting a good edge. And the board is always trying to flop down onto the bench and mess up my accuracy. Now, a lot of people make a much wider shooting board to fix this problem, but I'm working on a small bench here, and I don't really have the real estate. Luckily, there's an easy solution that doesn't take up much space. I've got a long scrap of hardwood that's just a little taller than my shooting board. I trace the height with a pencil and plane it down. Then I can add a cleat so it catches the edge of my bench. And because we need one slick feature, I'll drill the side of the fence and epoxy in some little neodymium magnets. Those magnets will hold screws. Pressing those screw tips to the side of the shooting board gives me the location to drill and install more magnets. And because we want the finished board to be easy to grab, I'm going to drill a nice big hole in this lower corner and cut a smooth radius with my turning saw. The final board is a bit more high-tech looking than I'd planned, but all the features make it easier to use and more durable. Take a day to make this thing, and you'll have it for years. So I just cut this board, and I want to shoot the end. My shooting board is conveniently stored right under my bench, and it sets up in seconds. The board I'm shooting is especially long, so I set up the support block, and now my stock is held flat and steady, and I can get on with trimming it. 
I've been using a support block with my old shooting board for over a year, and I find the space in between makes a great place to set a couple of edge tools. It's like having a little tool well, and you can lay boards right across without bothering your tools. Of course, some clever person is going to tell me that the magnets I've installed are going to stick to my tools, but it's not a problem. You can get really close to those magnets before they actually grab anything. So the world is filled with complicated shooting board designs, and honestly, I kind of like them. I sort of like gizmos. But when I'm actually making furniture, I shoot a hundred plain old 90 degree angles for every single miter that I shoot. And I never shoot anything besides a 90 and a 45. So I keep a dedicated miter shooting board just hanging on the wall. I don't use it very often so it doesn't get messed up and it pretty much never needs to be replaced. But in the interest of fairness, let's hear what James has to say. You know, to be completely honest, 99.9% .9 of all the work I've ever done on a shooting board works phenomenally with just a standard shooting board. So what Rex is doing is the best way to get started and get you into a shooting board. But if you're one of those people who you just want to have a little bit more, um, this is really kind of set up for that. With this slope on here, I can then do box miters where I can pop this off because it just has simple pins in there. Uh, with this jig on here, I can loosen this up with one hand and now I can set it to any angle I want very specific accurate angles on there and I can do picture frame miters as well as any other shape if I want to do pentagon miters it's really quick and easy set it up on there lock it down and you're shooting so if you want to see something with a few more bells and whistles um there you go now if I'm being totally honest I actually really like James's board. He has packed a ton of features into that thing. It's extremely useful, it's really thoughtful. It is complex, but he's still doing the same thing I am, looking out for the hand tool woodworker in the small shop, trying to make things accessible. Because let's be honest, any idiot can make a good shooting board with a table saw. I mean, seriously, how do you think I built this one? Now, I always have plans available, and this time is no different. They are long, detailed, and very affordable. And James and I are doing a special deal. If you buy my plans at the regular price, we're going to throw in James's plans for free. And if you buy James's plans from him, you get my plans for free. You can buy them from either one of us. It doesn't make any difference. And while you're watching this video, you might have been interested in my DIY turning saw and my miter shooting board. You can get both of these tools along with four other jigs and tools for your hand tool shop in my Journeyman's Plan Bundle. It's got six plans in it at a really low price. You can check out the link to all the different plans and bundles that I have down in the description or you can go to rexkruger.com slash store. And let me be honest here, I give James a really hard time on camera, but the reality is, I like him a lot. James was the first other creator to treat me like a colleague and to help me promote my channel when I was just getting started. I probably wouldn't be where I am without him. And huge thanks for the fun, Rex. This has been a blast. We gotta do more like this, so anytime you want. Back at you, buddy. And James and I both know that we wouldn't be here at all without our patrons, our channel members, and our viewers. Thanks so much for watching.